welcome to Parship House. The year is 1752. That's almost 300 years ago. Governor Alexander was in charge of eight villages in northern Russia. No running water, no electricity. He had a mayor that supervised each of the eight villages, and he would visit the villages once or twice a year, and the mayor of each village would send a monthly update to Governor Alexander to let him know about the goings on in the village. In the month of September, Governor Alexander went to visit one of the villages that was in the most remote, farthest part in northern Russia. It was a farming village, and it was quite far from the city, and therefore it was a little bit backward. It was very simple, and people lived very wholesome, nice, simple lives, but they didn't quite have the same exposure to social graces or to new inventions. And so, when Governor Alexander reached the village and the mayor, Nicholas, invited him to his home, because that's where the meetings would take place, it was a way to show honor to Governor Alexander. Mayor Nicholas and his wife were so delighted to welcome Governor Alexander to their home and to sit down with him to drink some tea and talk about all the goings on in the town. The farmer and his wife made the tea together. They had scooped up some water from a muddy stream and put it up to boil. Governor Alexander, the mayor and his wife, sat at the table together and the governor took a sip of tea, spit it right out. Blah, disgusting. What what did you serve me? This tastes like dirt. This is terrible. What is this? Oh, said the mayor. That's how we make tea. We get water from the stream and we boil it up. And Governor Alexander said, I want to teach you something. And he said, there's something called cheesecloth. It's a very, very tight piece of fabric. And when you have water that's very dirty and you want to use it to make tea, you pour it over the cheesecloth and the dirt stays on top and the water comes through. Wow. Thank you for teaching that to us, Mayor Nicholas and his wife, Nicole, were amazed. What a great invention, cheesecloth. Thank you so much for teaching that to us. We'll be delighted to make tea this way moving forward. Water that's muddied should not be used. They had a lovely visit, and Governor Alexander was quite happy that he was able to teach them that lesson. And when the visit was over, he left, and they went back to their day-to-day life. The next month, Governor Alexander received his report from the village, and he was shocked to read that there was a fire in that very village that he had visited. And the report said that there was plenty of water There were plenty of people around to pour the water on the fire, and there was plenty of time to extinguish the fire before it spread. But for some reason, the fire destroyed most of the buildings in the town. Thankfully, none of the people were hurt. But how did that happen? Governor Alexander got on his horse and buggy and went right back to Mayor Nicholas and his wife Nicole's house. He had to figure out what happened. Where was the error? What was the mistake? 
Hello, Governor Alexander. Thank you for coming to visit us. We're delighted to see you. It's so sad that there was a fire. Yes, it is very sad that there was a fire, said Governor Alexander, and I'm trying to understand the report. How is most of the city destroyed? It says that there was enough water, there were enough people, and there was enough time. And still the fire spread and destroyed most of the city. Mayor Nicholas said, Governor, you're not going to believe it. The people wanted to use the muddy water from the stream to put out the fire. Could you believe that? I stopped them and I said, excuse me, excuse me, wonderful townspeople. You cannot use muddy water. We have to filter the water. We have to remove the small rocks. We have to remove the dirt. Ever since you visited us last, Governor Alexander, I allow no muddy or dirty water to be used in our village. Governor Alexander shouted at the mayor. What? I cannot believe what my ears are hearing. How foolish. If you're making a cup of tea, you filter the water. You don't want to drink mud. Not for a fire. When a fire is raging, when a fire is spreading, you put out the fire immediately. Even with dirty water. Oh, Mayor Nicholas said, I see what you're saying. That is a good point. I'll learn from it and I won't do that again. Oh, well, it's a little late, Governor Alexander was thinking. But I guess I need to spend a little bit more time with this mayor and do a little bit more training and educating. In this week's Parsha, Parashat Shmini, we learn about which animals are kosher and which animals are not kosher. Now, we know that the Torah never wastes a single word. Rabbi Kamenetsky shared the following message with me that I want to share with you. In Parashat Noach, when Noach is bringing in kosher and non-kosher animals into the teva, the Torah says, min ha ha tehora, he had to bring from the animals that are tehorim, that the behim, if the Torah doesn't waste a single word, why does it refer to the non-kosher animals as ha asher enena tehora, the animal that is not pure? Why doesn't the Torah just say back in Parshat Noach, Min ha And Rabbi Kamenetsky quoted from the Gemara in Pesachim that these eight letters were used in the Torah for a very special reason that Rabbi Hoshua explains. When we have a choice and we can say something in a nice way, we always say it in a nice way, even if it means adding an extra word, an extra eight letters to the Torah. The Torah, when possible, avoids calling those non-kosher animals tamay, and rather says, Torah. This week in Parshat Shemini, when it's talking about which animals are kosher and which animals are not kosher, and it teaches us the kosher signs, when an animal doesn't have those kosher signs of chewing its cud and of split hooves, for example, like a pig or a camel, the Torah uses the word tamay. How come here in Parshat Shemini it says tamay? But in Parshat Noach, it used such nice language, Asheri Nena Torah. When Noach is talking about the animals that are kosher and non-kosher, it's a story. So the Torah is looking to speak about those animals that are non-kosher in the most positive way. Because for the sake of the story, it doesn't really make a difference if the animals are called not tahor instead of tameh. So the Torah chose a nicer, kinder, gentler way to describe them. 
But when the Torah is teaching us which animals we can eat because they're not kosher, it has to speak in a very bold, direct term. This is Tamei or this is Tamei'a. Keep away from it. In this world that we live in, we have to have clarity to know what we have to say no to, what we have to be very strong in. If something is going to be an action that is wrong, We have to be direct. We can't just say, oh, it's not really so good. When we have clarity on something that we need to avoid, we need to be direct and say no. But life is nuanced and there's a time and place for everything. So when we have the luxury to use really nice words, because it's not an emergency that needs to be handled right away, like a fire or like an action that is a very negative action. When we're in a situation where it is clear that it is something that is not the right thing to do, we have to say, no, it's the wrong thing to do. But when we can use proper manners, we want to do that in the right time, in the right situation. When a fire is spreading like in that village, there has to be a powerful, strong response. Even if the water is muddy, we use that water to put out the fire. If an animal isn't kosher, the answer is no. We can't eat that animal. When there's something that we could speak about gently, we do that. But when there's something that's not okay, We're very clear about that. So try now to think about an example in your life where you can afford to use more gentle language and an example where you might be tempted to do something wrong and it has to be very direct and very strong. I hope that this lesson from Parashat Shemini that we're going to bring into our lives will serve as a zechut for our beloved chayalim and our brothers and sisters in Israel. Shabbat Shalom.